Hello, I'm Neil Capron. I'm part of the Android Kernel Integrity team, and I'm here to talk about access control for BPF programs and uh, enabling core in Android. How do I advance the slides? All right, so starting off with some goals, uh, we need to modernize the BPF frameworks in Android itself. So enable core and enable the modern libbpf based helpers. Uh, more information on that in a, in a few minutes. The other primary goal is enabling secure vendor access to BPF trace points. Um, this is something that we've been asked for, for a long time and um, haven't been able to open up just yet and ultimately build uh, a solid foundation for future use cases. So some of the requirements we have, we really need to minimize uh, impact of boot time. We've actually had to revert some of the BPF functionality in the past um, due to low performance devices really getting delayed up to um, like seconds on boot. Uh, we need to be very uh, cognizant of our use of memory in this and we need to control access to where BPF programs are attached. So for those of you who don't know much about BPF, this is a very simplified high-level overview. Um, essentially, it's a, a system to extend kernel functionality from user space um, in a secure manner. It's a virtual machine in, in the kernel that can basically a program is compiled to BPF bytecode and then there is a BPF app application, which includes functionality to load that bytecode byte through a syscall into the kernel. Um, on the kernel side, there's a verifier that makes sure that there's no indefinite loops, um, that reads are initialized prior to being read, things like that. Um, and ultimately, these programs can be attached to the events, various event sources in the kernel. So trace points, perf events, things like that. Uh, there's BPF maps, which allow you to uh, have communication with user space as well. So libbpf is the primary user space library used with BPF. Um, it's maintained as part of the kernel tree. There are other libraries being developed at this point, um, but this is kind of the reference implementation. Um, it provides helper functions for a lot of the application development, things like that loading piece, attaching to the, the trace points, map creation, and has the core implementation. So this is a very important piece uh, to enable. So I've mentioned core, what is it? Uh, it's compile once, run everywhere. So basically uh, it attempts to solve port portability issues for uh, BPF programs which are compiled into bytecode for one kernel version and then running on another kernel version that may have resized structures or move things around. Um, it's important to note that it's a user space concept and um, it does not address the use case where the meaning of a, a structure variable changes. So Android's current implementation, uh, we have a single point of access for BPF loading. Uh, so that is BPF loader. It runs as part of the early init process and it's a single threaded program that loads all of the different uh, BPF pro programs from various sources. Um, it's based on a custom library, and I say library very generously, um, a, a series of header files that handle the syscalls, things like that. Um, and it, it is very out of date compared to modern standards. So here's a, a block diagram of that. You can see the three different program classes or sources on the left side. So the system is part of AOSP. Uh, networking is in an apex. So this is things that monitor like bandwidth um, and, and do attribution to applications for that and vendor, so vendors basically can, can layer their programs on top of it. However, they're very restricted currently. Uh, so then for the BPF application, it loads, the, it loads a file and it compares that file based on where its location is to an allow list. And we'll see more on that in a second. You can see the Android specific library there. And uh, yeah, next slide. So these are the, the program types. The, it's, a, it's a small subset of what's available upstream. You can see networking is by far the largest user of this system has a few more permissions and vendor has only socket filter access right now, but has requested trace point performance or perf events and K probes. 
So how do we go about enabling core in Android? Well, we could continue to do our uh, custom Android specific library. I don't want to do that. That sounds like a maintenance nightmare and we'll always be lagging. Um, we can inter integrate the standard libbpf into the existing BPF loader. This still has some challenges about it, uh, specifically the boot time and compatibility. This is a major one is because we're dealing with the kernel version, the vendor program version, and the system library version, and the BPF loaders inclusion of this, there's all these pieces that could change independently and is a compatibility nightmare. So the third thing I've come up with is basically enabling programs to use uh, libbpf natively. And I'll, I have block diagrams for this in a, in a few slides. And the big thing about this is it resolves the compatibility issue, but there's work that we need to do to develop a access control mechanism. And there are probably other approaches, so I'm open to, to feedback there. So attach point ac access control. So in order to open up this access, we need to control what, uh, what functions and, and where you can attach things in the kernel. So they, the programs need to be, or the trace points need to be part of the KMI before we allow attaching it. So again, this could be accomplished by extending the BPF loader with an additional allow list, or we could create a BPF program or kernel module that hooks into the kernel's BPF program load or BPF program uh, attach functions, allowing us to validate at a lower level. So this is the first approach of extending BPF loader. So you can see the, the big changes here is we've moved networking off to its, its own net BPF load application. This is due to the networking apex running on devices that are about, uh, that go back to 4.9 kernels that don't have modern core support. Um, and the, the primary BPF loader has an additional attach point allow list in there, as well as the libbpf library uh, with the core relocation mechanism. This is kind of the, the proposed native libbpf uh, solution that I've come up with. So basically each application at uh, whether it's system, vendor, or networking can all use whatever library to perform the syscall they want. And it, it can be statically linked, resolving the uh, compatibility issue there. And if you look in the bottom right corner, you see the new functionality for the access control BPF program. So kind of hooking the syscall as part of uh, part of loading it as well as attaching it. So with this, we need to be able to update this from user space. So that's a piece I have yet to figure out. That's one of the big questions is how do we do that? Um, and I have some, some questions lined up here that I can come back to, but um, ultimately what, what do the vendors need from us? Um, are there other approaches that we can consider, we should consider? Is security going to allow this, this uh, new approach? Because they are a lot of the definition that, sorry, they were the reason for the current definition of, of the policy and how come it was so restricted. And uh, looking forward, you know, what other program types can we enable, should we enable, and how to control that. So with that, I'll open it up to questions. Um, I know I covered a lot of material very quickly, but yeah. Hi. So one of the like first question I have is like, like BPF, you can do the same basically with, with kernel modules really, and you already have vendor hooks and all the kind of stuff. So what's the use case we are enabling over here? One issue that worries me with BPF is that I feel the audibility or the like being able to audit, audit it and like security as well. And I'm not sure like if it is still completely you can enforce open sourcing the code of BPF or not is, is something that concerns. And I'm not sure what you can achieve with BBF that's not already achievable by writing a module that hooks into the hooks, the same thing, sure. because it's doing the same thing. Really. I think one of the main reasons for BPF is the uh, security that it provides going through that verifier piece. Uh, it really does, it has a cleanup. Uh, so memory leaks, uh, it validates that the memory that you're accessing is there and initialized. So there's a lot of security and, and pieces there. Obviously it is opening up the interface to a lot and that's where we need to be cognizant about where we attach things. Um, and other than that, we, we wanna allow people to do 
to continue this development, right? And see where it can go. All right, so um, when you ran through that the first time around, it sort of made me think about SE Linux. I was just wondering why not just extend SE Linux to sort of have some sort of cognizance of what you're trying to do here. And that would sort of be useful to other people as well. Yeah, I honestly have not considered that approach. Some of the upstream approaches have looked at uh, what's called BPF tokens, where you you validate the source of a program and uh, delegate a token to do certain actions. The concerns there are timelines of including a, a greater development piece like this. I feel like a BPF program could be implemented in the short term. Um, and then as the community continues to grow the security pieces around it, we can integrate them going forward. But really to enable vendors short term, um, th this is something that could be attainable there. I snuck out of the BPF track to come in. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. thank, thank you for this presentation. I, I, um, I just wanted to sort of try to cross pollinate a little bit. Um, I know there's been some discussions about what, what we call like a gatekeeper program. Yep. Uh, in, in that space around perhaps having a policy based on BPF, even to enforce who can load BPF. Um, so there are programs like Tetragon out there, which I think can can do this sort of thing. Yes. Um, and then there's a lot of related discussions around signing of, of BPF programs and stuff like that, which also sort of relates. So I just wanted to bring that up in general, but uh, yeah. I, I, I appreciate that. I don't know I how much time speaking to- Speaking in a couple, uh, awesome. Awesome. Uh, a couple hours over there, cool. and I want to address those concerns directly because I, I think what's out there right now is very targeted towards cloud applications and more about who can load stuff in the kernel. We need a lot more granularity as to what can pe what can people do when they're using a program in the kernel or when they're attaching it. So I want to extend that that conversation there. So and maybe maybe a question. So I think you had kind of two models. Maybe one one is um a, a program type allow list in user space and the other is maybe enforcing it in the kernel. Yep. What's your base? Do, do you have a? a so the, the current format? approach with the BPF, this application here in user space, it doesn't solve the boot time problem. And as more BPF users uh, show up or more people are using BPF, I think it's really just going to continue to delay that boot process, whereas and limit what libraries can be used um, along with the, the compatibility of the vendors uh, vendors programs are compiled against this version, systems compiled against this, and networking's here. And so really trying to solve it at a more generic, lower layer, and then allowing develop user space developers to really do what they want. Uh, yeah, so, so I was actually wondering about that user space compatibility thing as well. So. Uh, so I guess if if your BPF program is referencing kernel structures uh, and you, you upgrade your kernel underneath without upgrading user space, there could be breaks there, correct? Yes, absolutely. So basically, there's a lot of policy that we need to define as Android as a whole about who's responsible when certain things happen as far as kernel updates, because we don't have that KMI stability between kernel branches. Yeah. Um, so there's there's a piece there that we need to develop on the policy side things. Uh, and I think right now we're basically looking at when the kernel is upgraded, all bets are off for the existing pieces. Um, but we're trying to understand the user space compatibility so that people can move forward there. Yeah. It seems like from the upgrade scenario, you'd want to consider them almost like external modules, right? And upgrade them alongside your kernel. Yeah. yeah okay. As far as like <clears throat> user space <clears throat> and kernel um, compatibility goes, uh, currently, like um, we support launching new devices with like the latest Android version on multiple kernel versions. You can launch Android 13 510 with an Android 14 or Android 15 user space. Is that going to pose a problem as far as like jumping to the latest libbpf library? Yes, absolutely. So that's where uh, <laughs> that's where we're trying to thank you uh, trying to figure out the the ability to separate that. The existing stuff right now is very much tied to the network apex, um, and so that's being separated out. And we're kind of looking for fifteen forward. Um, 
And as far as how GRF plays into all this, I am working that out still. So that's that's open for discussion. And I, I really need help with the team to, to help define these things. So thank you very much. <laughs>